Hi, I'm Hideo Mabuchi, and this is my Enseca lecture on microscopic analysis of wood fired surfaces. I'm going to try to save a lot of time for questions at the end of the talk, so please make note of any points you'd like to hear more about. When we think about connections between ceramics and geology, what first comes to mind is something about the natural origins of clay as weathered minerals of the Earth's crust. Here we see a little ball of wild clay near where it was found in a glacial outwash plain in Iceland. But one of my main themes in this talk will be to emphasize a distinct connection between ceramics and geology, which has to do with the way unglazed clay surfaces develop color as they are fired and cooled in a wood-burning kiln. The photo on the right side of this slide is again from Iceland, this time of a field of scoria. Scoria, which is a lot like pumice, is created in volcanic eruptions, and the difference between the red and black patches shown here stems from differing reduction oxidation conditions as the rocks were blasted out of a volcanic cone and immediately thereafter, which is to say, as they were cooling. The images on the left side of the slide are both of wood-fired and reduction-cooled stoneware pots, same clay body but very different results. As with the scoria, the key factor in determining red versus black color was the reduction oxidation conditions these pots experienced while cooling. If we put on kiln shades and peek into the stacking chamber of a wood-burning kiln at cone 10, we like to see that the surfaces of our pots are getting glossy and shimmery. In the fluxy atmosphere of a wood-burning kiln at stoneware temperatures, the outer skin of even our unglazed pots can start to liquefy into an aluminosilicate melt that physically resembles magma. When lava spills out from a volcano and starts to cool, minerals can crystallize out of the melt, and the sizes and kinds of minerals that form determine the final colors and textures of the resulting igneous rock. The types of minerals that form are of course constrained by the elemental composition of the lava, but the rate of cooling and redox conditions during cooling also have very strong effects. When wood-fired pots cool in the kiln, a similar process of crystal formation occurs but at a much smaller scale. Because the molten skin on the pot's surfaces are generally very thin, and cooling happens much faster than in a giant lava flow, the crystals are generally microscopic. But there can be a lot of them, and they can be strongly colored, so with our unaided eyes we tend to perceive patches of different kinds or densities of microcrystals as color and texture gradations over the surfaces of our pots. As potters with an interest in the underlying science, we'd really like to develop a deeper understanding of the physical processes by which these color-generating microcrystals grow. In addition to giving us a much richer appreciation for the magic of wood-fired ceramic surfaces, such knowledge can help guide us towards fruitful experimentation with our materials and with temperature redox schedules for firing and cooling. In this talk, I'll review two case studies that illuminate different kinds of iron reds, highlighting how empirical evidence points towards possible mechanisms of crystal formation and how such hypotheses point towards further studies and experimentation. Our first case study builds on a foundation of decades of innovative scientific research led by Minoru Fukuhara and Yoshihiro Kusano. This group of chemists and material scientists utilized firing experiments and sophisticated electron microscopy techniques to analyze the red coloration effect known as hidasuki within the Bizen tradition of Japanese wood-fired stoneware pottery. They show that the red cord marks of hidasuki are associated with localized fluxing of the ceramic surface by potassium released from combustion of rice straw that is wrapped around the pots. Fukuhara, Kusano, and co-workers used transmission electron microscopy to determine that the red color comes from clusters of small hematite crystals that grow around the edges of larger corundum crystals. The figures on this slide, taken from their 2009 review article, show some details of their firing experiments and physical analysis. On the left, we have before and after photographs of pots formed from the iron-bearing Bizen stoneware clay and wrapped in rice straw. During the firing, the straw burns away, leaving only powdery wisps of residual silica. Underneath the straw remnants, we see the reddish hidasuki coloration. Moving to the central set of images, we can see on the hidasuki bowl 
that the buff areas have a stony matte finish, while the red cord marks are slightly glossy from the rice straw's potassium. By taking samples of the outer surface from both buff and red regions of fired pots, Fukuhara, Kusano, and co-workers were able to determine that the primary crystalline structures in buff regions are mullite needles, while the fluxed red regions contain distinctive aggregates of corundum and hematite, as shown in the upper right TEM image. Using diffraction techniques in transmission electron microscopy, it is possible to identify mineral phases of even nanoscale crystals with high confidence and accuracy, which is crucial for piecing together this story. Fukuhara and Kusano describe how corundum crystals, which are stable at high temperatures, provide atomic templates on which red hematite crystals can nucleate and grow as the, sur as the ceramic surface is cool. As we'll discuss in a few slides, this could be a key insight to guide future experimentation with materials and firing schedules to enhance flashing on wood-fired pots. But first, I'll need to try to convince you that these hematite corundum structures are central not only to Hidatsuki red cord marks, but to a very wide range of reddish flashing effects. Here we have a photo of a Kazegama-style kiln of the type developed by Steve Davis, which is basically a gas kiln into which we blow wood ash once the pots are up to cone 9 or 10. My version has a minimal sort of flue, with the kiln exhaust directed up from the back of the stacking chamber by this set of dry stack bricks. I'm showing a setup in which a white light laser beam is directed uh, through the exhaust stream before hitting collection optics that direct the transmitted light to a portable spectrometer. This setup makes it possible to monitor how much different wavelengths of light are absorbed by whatever gases are present in the kiln exhaust. The data plotted in the upper right corner of the slide um, shows two sets of sharp dips, as indicated by the blue arrows, that occur exactly at the wavelengths that would be expected for absorption by sodium and potassium gas, and these dips only appear once wood ash has been introduced into the kiln. I think it's safe to assume that if we see sodium and potassium in the atmosphere of a gas kiln with a few quarts of added wood ash, there's sodium and potassium in the atmosphere of a wood-burning kiln. The upper right photo on this slide shows a pot fired in this Kazegama kiln with a wavy stripe of some light salmon-colored flashing. I cut out a piece of the flashed surface with the Dremel tool, as shown in the central image, and then etched away some of the surface glass using a procedure developed by Fukuhara and Kusano. This exposed microcrystals that were embedded in the surface glass so that I could image them using optical and electron microscopy. The images on the left and lower right of this slide are representative of the types of crystal structures I observed with an optical microscope. Keeping in mind the results of Fukuhara and Kusano's prior studies, I think it's reasonable to interpret that we see stacks of clear hexagonal corundum crystals, some of which have edges that are decorated by red hematite crystals. The corundum templates are roughly 10 microns in length scale. There is also a diffuse yellowish background in some areas, which I would attribute to iron-doped mullite. If you're curious about this, please consult my written article that accompanies this lecture in this year's NSICA journal. In any case, I believe this kind of observation shows that the reddishness of the flashing on this pot is caused by the same kind of microcrystal formation that causes Hidatsuki red cord marks. Here, sodium and potassium in the kiln atmosphere substitute for the potassium given off by burning rice straw in the Bizen method. In any atmospheric firing with porcelainous or light stoneware clays, we might thus reasonably guess that this type of hematite corundum mechanism might be at play on any slightly glossy surface region with some sort of reddish tint that hasn't been covered over by fly ash, soda, etc. As additional confirmation that the red outlined hexagons I found are the same types of hematite corundum aggregates that Fukuhara and Kusano discovered, I show in this slide some images acquired using an instrument called a NanoSIMS that we have in the Stanford Nano Shared Facilities at Stanford University. Using the nanosims, we can zoom in on just one of these hexagons and map the presence of different atomic elements with submicron spatial resolution. In the computer-generated image in the lower right corner, the blue intensity of each pixel corresponds to the level of aluminum, green to silicon, and red to iron. The composite image thus confirms that the bulk of the hexagonal crystal is aluminum oxide, while its rim is iron oxide.
So what is our takeaway from all this as far as making pots is concerned? The Fukuhara Kusano mechanism shows how the presence of corundum crystal templates can steer any iron present in the ceramic surface to form red hematite as opposed to being incorporated within mullite crystals that would tend towards yellow or brown. This would seem to suggest that we try incorporating alumina in clay bodies or flashing slips as corundum is AL203 is alumina. My one trial so far in this direction was to mix up a small batch of porcelain from equal weights Grolig, Helmer, Nefsi, and calcined alumina. As you might guess, this was not very nice to work with, but I made a few small pots and fired them a few years ago with Chris Watt out at the Truro Center for the Arts. As you might also guess, this 25% alumina clay body stayed pretty bisky except in the very hottest parts of the kiln, but as shown in this image, it was capable of achieving a pretty deep red even without any added iron in the clay body. The stark white wad marks further support the idea that added flux facilitates, uh, facilitates hematite formation. I think a good plan for future work in this direction would be to experiment systematically with temperature and redox schedules for firing and cooling, perhaps with applied flux in an electric kiln, as Fukuhara and Kusano did in their work on Hidaski. And a milestone technical objective would be to match such experimental data with a quantitative nucleation and crystal growth model that captures the competition between templated hematite crystallization and iron sequestration in mullite. Recently, however, my own work has been focused on a very different mechanism of iron red formation. In collaboration with Dan Murphy, John Neely, and their students at Utah State University, we've worked for the past few years to try to understand the formation processes of what are commonly known as reduction cool reds. These are produced by delayed reoxidation of reduction fired iron bearing stoneware clays and are characterized by intense color and a velvety visual texture. They generally appear against a black background. On this slide, we see some examples of reduction cool reds on wood-fired pots, as well as a rusty piece of sheet metal on the far right. This juxtaposition is meant to highlight visual properties that reduction cool reds share with rust. Dan Murphy and I started our kiln-based research with the idea of pulling draw tiles during a reduction cool. We hoped that this could be used kind of like draw rings in a salt firing to judge when the down fire had reached a low enough temperature for the elusive reds to appear. As you can see from these photos, our tiles were actually little square cups, which we designed this way in order to have nice flat surfaces for microscope imaging. This slide shows the temperature log of our first reduction cool with the draw tiles. While there was a huge amount of tile to tile variation based on stacking position, with a bit of rationalization, one could discern an overall color trend in which tiles pulled early in the reduction down fire, which is to say at higher temperatures, were generally brown. Tiles pulled later, that is to say at lower temperatures, became successively purple and then dull red. When we hit 1400 Fahrenheit in this particular down fire, we tried to hover for an extended time there by wicking through the peeps of uh, the train kiln. By the end of roughly two hours of hovering in this way, we started pulling tiles with bright red surfaces. Of course, during this hover, we were allowing quite a bit of air back into the stacking chamber. On this slide, starting from the upper left and going clockwise around, we have larger representative images of what I've referred to as brownish, purple, dull red, and bright red. Those of you who fire for reduction cool reds will be familiar with the tendency to find them mainly on surfaces that have been exposed to the kiln atmosphere, but not covered over with fly ash. So for example, as shown here on the backsides or bottoms of pots. The microscope image on the right side of this slide shows a magnified view of something like one square centimeter of reduction cool red surface. Already at this magnification, we can see that the color is quite splotchy, varying from purple to intense red, and that there are what look like tiny black crystals all over the place. I should say that this clay body is Dan Murphy's 50-50 mix of Lysella and Fredericksburg fire clay.
I'd like to progress to showing some very high magnification electron microscope images of this surface, but in order to be able to correlate what we see in those monochrome images with color features such as reduction cool reds and the embedded black crystals, we need to find some landmarks in the color images that we can also find in the electron micrographs. On this slide in the center, we see where a sample chunk was cut from one of the draw tiles. On the left, we have a wide field image from the sample. And then in the lower right, an enlarged detail of a distinctive silvery ginkgo leaf or manta ray shaped feature. We're going to use this manta ray feature as our landmark for the next few slides. So down in the lower right, we have that same enlarged detail of the manta ray shaped feature. And on the left hand side is an electron microscope image of roughly the same field of view. So this silvery manta ray thing that I'm tracing out with the laser pointer in the color image, we can see the same thing just barely kind of because of textural differences in this monochrome electron micrograph. And so roughly this area that I'm tracing is the silvery part. The kind of rim around it, as you can see from the color image, is a very bright red. And you can even see in the electron microscope image some of these things that appear as embedded black crystals in the color microscope image. And so here for scale, at this magnification in the electron microscope, uh, this scale bar is about 300 microns. Before we move on to looking at even higher magnification electron microscope images, I wanted to note that the electron microscope has an attached tool called an energy dispersive spectrometer, which can be used to map the surface concentrations of different atomic elements much like we saw a few slides ago with the NanoSIMS instrument. Referring again to our landmark detail enlargement in the lower right, we see in the center of this slide a kind of heat map for the presence of iron in this field of view, and below it, a similar heat map for silicon. The main thing to note from these is that the silvery and red color patches are characterized by high iron concentration and low silicon concentration, while the embedded black crystals are just the reverse. It's interesting to note that in the reduction cool red uh, areas, the EDS tool estimates the elemental composition on the surface to be as high as 50% iron by weight, whereas Dan's 50-50 clay body that these tiles are made from is only a few percent iron. So somehow where we see these intense reduction cool reds, the surface concentration of iron has become much higher than in the bulk clay body. So now let's look at a higher magnification electron microscope image. Note the scale bar now at five microns, which shows the interface between a red colored region and one of the embedded black crystals. The red region towards the top and left has the structure of piles of small grains, which we can guess on the basis of the EDS data to be nanocrystals of iron oxides. The black crystal region towards the right and bottom looks contrastingly smooth and glassy, and the topography of the image seems to suggest that the scene is like piles of iron oxide rubble heaped up on the shores of a frozen silicate lake. Looking out across one of these frozen silicate lakes, we can find some features where islands of iron oxide rubble appear to be bursting up through the surface of the silicate lake. Focus, for example, on the lower left corner of this electron micrograph. Images like this, together with the EDS data that shows a strong surface enhancement of iron concentration in red areas, lead me to believe that reduction cool reds are created by a microphysical process that was first studied by Reed Cooper and co-workers for completely different reasons in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Cooper and co-workers performed experiments in which reduced iron-bearing alkaline aluminosilicate glass samples were melted at high temperature and then cooled with reoxidation occurring either above or below their glass transition temperature. In samples that were reoxidized at higher temperatures, oxygen would diffuse into the surfaces and oxidize iron atoms in place still buried within the glass. But when reoxidation was delayed to lower temperatures, the iron atoms themselves would be pulled up to the surface and accumulate there as a thick layer of iron oxide crystals. Relating this to reduction cool wood firing, the lesson would be that in order to achieve strong reduction cool reds, we should fire iron-bearing stoneware clays with a good reduction soak at top temperatures 
and then during cooling prevent the kiln atmosphere from returning to oxidation until the temperature drops to roughly the glass transition temperature of the ceramic surfaces. If we then let air back into the kiln only at this lower temperature, reduced iron will be pulled from the depths of the clay up to the surface and converted there into red iron oxides. Now, the tricky part of all this, of course, is knowing what this glass transition temperature actually corresponds to in terms of your pyrometer readings. There's probably no universal answer to this, as it will depend on your clay body compositions, your firing schedule, and the amount of flux gas given off by the wood you're using. But clearly, people who regularly fire for reduction cool reds figure this out for the materials and processes they use. On this next slide, I want to quickly show some data that further supports the connection between reduction cool reds and the Cooper mechanism. The EDS data shown in the false color image shows that the iron oxide nanocrystals that are pulled up through the glassy silicate surface are accompanied by some sort of magnesium oxide. This kind of thing would be expected according to the analysis of, Co of Cooper and coworkers, but perhaps difficult to account for within other candidate explanations of reduction cool red formation. In particular, I sometimes hear people speculate that the excess surface iron associated with reduction cool reds may have been deposited from the kiln atmosphere, much like fly ash. In this optical microscope image of a cross-section of reduction cooled ceramic sample, however, we see that even bubbles within the clay wall, which are presumably connected to the outside atmosphere by thin cracks, um, can develop reduction cool red coatings like little geodes. I think it's very hard to explain this if you believe that the iron comes from the kiln atmosphere, as in cases like this one, the ceramic surface above the bubble is far less red than inside the bubble. Encircling back just for a moment to connections with geology, I wanted to mention some work by Burkhard and Miller Sigmund from around 15 years ago in which they studied iron oxide accumulation on the surfaces trapped between successive lava flows. These authors concluded that the iron oxide layers were likely created by the same process that Cooper and co-workers studied and that I am proposing as a likely explanation for reduction cool reds. Getting back to ceramics, wood firing, and the practical question of how to optimize down firing to produce reduction cool reds, I wanted to finish my lecture by telling you about a very cool method that we've explored in our project with Utah State Ceramics, which doesn't quite tell us what we really want to know, but maybe points the way towards methods that could. What we'd really like to be able to do is to watch reduction cool reds forming in situ. That is, rather than pulling out draw tiles, we'd like to leave the pots in the kiln and monitor them somehow over long periods of time to see how their surfaces evolve during the downfire and after the reintroduction of oxygen. The idea that Dan Murphy and I pursued for some time was to try to take photographs of the ceramic surfaces throughout the course of the firing and cooling. Dan kindly created a four brick peep in the back of the workhorse train kiln at USU, and we experimented with setups involving a high resolution digital camera, macro zoom lens, strobe flash, and sapphire windows to protect the equipment from radiant heat whenever we opened the peep. Of course, we all know that when you look in a peep at high temperatures, everything is glowing and you need to get tricky to see any colors other than orange. The strategy we used was simply to stop down the aperture of the camera and reduce the exposure length until we were recording dark frames despite the thermal incandescent glow of the ceramic surfaces. We then kept these same camera settings but increased the intensity of the strobe flash until we could record reflected light images. So the three images in this sequence were all taken within a few minutes of each other with the Kelnet Cone 10 just under different exposure and lighting conditions. So this is like these are like the real reflected color surfaces of these tiles at cone 10 during the firing. This image now shows the view through the four brick peep after the kiln was completely cool and open to the air. As you can see, most of the surfaces are ashy and therefore not surfaces on which we would expect to find reduction cool reds. However, if you look carefully, you can see that there are some physical backsides of the little square tile cups that actually did develop reduction cool reds. 
The nice thing about having used the high resolution camera, macro lens, and strobe lighting is that we could go back through all the images we acquired at various points in the cooling and zoom in on these small regions of interest. Let me start by uh, saying that on this slide only, the images have been processed to enhance the color contrast so that we can try to discern the emergence of reds as sensitively as possible. The region of interest is shown from photographs taken 45 minutes, 4 hours, 8 hours, 13 hours, 27 hours, 35 hours, and 55 hours after the last cooling stoke, that is after we stopped doing the downfiring. I think you can see the gradual emergence of something like reduction cool red but what puzzled us about this data at first is that the temperature in the kiln was all the way down to something like 700 Fahrenheit, which would be about 370 Celsius, before the red starts to become visible. This is a much lower temperature than we would have expected based on the Cooper mechanism, or even just a general sense of the temperature range in which any chemical changes are happening on a ceramic surface. Fortunately, there have for some reason been prior scientific studies of the apparent color of hematite as a function of temperature. Using data from this paper by Yamanoi, Nakashima, and Katsura, I generated the color strip on the left side of this slide, which shows what one expects a hematite surface to look like to the eye at various temperatures. Nothing is changing about the material composition of the surface at these temperatures, but hematite just looks different when it gets hot. And we can see that it only really starts to look reddish when the temperature gets down somewhere between 300 to 400 Celsius in agreement with what we saw on the previous slide. On one hand, this is kind of a fatal flaw for the fancy photography approach that Dan and I have been working on in terms of its ability to directly show us when hematite starts to form on ceramic surfaces. On the other hand, it's a very nice validation of the feeling that many of us have that our pots look extra dull when we peek into the kiln while it's still hot and brighten up somewhat once they're out in the air. So is there anything better we can try to do to detect hematite formation on hot ceramic surfaces in situ? I think our best hope might be to try to use Raman spectroscopy. Explaining Raman spectroscopy is the subject of another talk entirely, but uh, let me just mention that it involves focusing a laser beam on the surface of interest and precisely analyzing the light that scatters back. This slide shows some data from an ongoing project with Simon Levin and Harry Levenstein, in which I used Raman microscopy to detect specific signatures of hematite and magnetite in some patches of reduction cool red. It would be a major undertaking to design a setup with which we could take Raman spectra from ceramic surfaces in a kiln at high temperature, but it's certainly not impossible. Something to scheme about for sure. Speaking of hematite and magnetite, many of you will know that reduction cool firings can produce colors on the iron spectrum other than the bright red of hematite. I've been wondering whether the yellowy, orangish, and butterscotch colors, as Dan calls them, may just be other forms of iron oxides and hydroxides. Fortunately, there is some prior work in the literature on the apparent colors of nanoparticles of such minerals, as shown in figure one from this paper by Sklut et al. And it's possible that Raman spectroscopy could be used to detect them on fired ceramic surfaces. But again, not completely straightforward, I think. So to conclude back where we started, I'd just like to reiterate how much I think we can learn from contemporary geology and material science about the physical processes of color formation on wood-fired surfaces. In particular, I've been looking to books and articles in igneous petrology and glass ceramics for sources of insight. Modern analytic instruments like optical, electron, and Raman microscopes can help us to get started in understanding what we're looking at when we scrutinize our favorite wood-fired surfaces, but the processes of color formation are so complex that it is generally difficult to draw any definitive conclusions. In order to build confidence in our hypothetical explanations, it helps immensely if we can make connections to knowledge structures in established scientific disciplines. We have to get a bit lucky to turn up such connections, since researchers in these other fields aren't generally burning wood to fire clay, but if you don't look, you don't find. My goal was to try to save half of the time in this session for questions, and it looks like I've almost managed to do that. So please let me know what I can try to clarify or elaborate. And thanks very much for listening.